guys, and welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink. We are the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing industry. So, no Jay today, but we have a Jane. Hi, Jane. How are we doing? Hi. I'm doing good. I'm sorry about last time. I kind of, as I was telling Katie earlier, I got into a challenging um, competitive game of cards with my kids. So, <laughs> last time I've lost track of time. So. <laughs> But the, the most important thing, though, did you win? Yes, I did. <laughs> Worth it. <laughs> yep. Totally. So I'm glad to be back. All right. Well, welcome back. And, of course, we've got a returning guest. Sarah, how are you doing? I am spiffy. At least I think I am. I don't I, we are, we're three weeks into NaNoWriMo. We are seven months into self-isolation. We are, what, three months into remote learning at school. I'm pretty sure that the next person who asks me a question is going to be yeeted off the balcony. <laughs> but otherwise, I'm good. Hey, right, we're not in hell, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, note to self, keep the questions to a minimum for Sarah. <laughs> and we got to welcome Megan. Megan, this is your first time on our show, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, I've been on Go Indie now a ton. Uh, this is my first time here, though, and I'm very, very excited to be here. Hi, I'm Megan Morgan. I'm the author of The Altered Wake and eventually The Altered Rise when I finish that one. Yeah. <laughs> like that when I finished it. Yep. I think we all we're all in that same spot somewhere in one of our work in progresses. All right. Well, speaking of Go Indie Now, we gotta pay homage to our sponsor. Hello everybody, I am Joe Compton and welcome to our channel Go Indie Now. This is the place that celebrates indie artists and indie art. And we do so by producing several shows that either air on daily, weekly, monthly or seasonal scheduling. And within those shows, we aim to educate and entertain you. If you're t if you're an indie artist who's trying to figure out how to do this, this is the place you need to be. If you're an indie artist who's looking to promote and doesn't have any avenues and, and is tired of the grind, this is the place to be. Because remember, it's always time to go indie now. I love that line. I absolutely do. It is. It's always time. To it's go always now. time. <laughs> That's right. And uh, before we get into our main topic of the day, which is the Audible Gate, um, wonderful thing that blew up this week, uh, I want you to know that tomorrow Joe is doing a town hall on Go Indy Now. It's going to be at 9 a.m. Pacific time, noon Eastern on the same topic. They're going to have a, a great group of authors together to talk about this issue, just like we're talking about tonight. So for more in-depth information, you definitely want to check that out tomorrow. And we'll be sure to put Go and D now's information as always in our show notes after the show is done recording. So, and, and before we jump into that, I have some information on the Amazon bank account debacle. <laughs> oh, oh yes, <laughs> they, we actually, need to. They, they actually did have a code promotion. You know, code go into their system to change their banking system, and it made it so that we all had to. Re <laughs> redo our banking stuff. <laughs> yeah, that was a strange email that came through. I, I thought it was spam when I first got it. I don't know yeah. if any of you guys got it, but they ran an email from Amazon telling you you had to change your banking information. Or you had to re, you know, it, it no longer was, was valid or whatnot. So yes. Um, and when you go to your KDP site, if you haven't done that yet, you get a big red banner at the top, which freaked me the hell out because <laughs> I didn't get the email. <laughs> I'm like, what? You've been paying me for three months or six months. Yeah, so that that was legit. And and the first thing when Jane sent it to me, she's like, I got an email to change my banking information. I was like, an email? Hold on, that doesn't yep. sound right. I, I'd gotten the same thing too. I mm -hmm. and I had to change mine before my U.S. payment came through. All the other ones mm -hmm. came through, but it was the U.S. payment that didn't come through until I changed it. Yeah, mine is still saying that, and they said give it a few days. Because I waited and I said, okay, I did everything you said to the letter on your instructions. If it's not okay by Wednesday, I'm calling you back. <laughs> so uh, another Amazon 
issue. So now we can go into the Audible issue. <laughs> Amazon is just messing up left and right, aren't they? Well, I work in software technology. I'm a business analyst. So I'm like, didn't they test this? <laughs> You're a big company. You have to test your stuff to the letter. You, you would think. You would think. <laughs> yes. All right. But anyways, as, as Rebecca asked us, is there a topic? Absolutely. And it's a good one. If uh, you haven't heard already, hashtag AudibleGate, search that on pretty much any social media and you are going to find a ton of information on what's going on right now. So that is what we're discussing tonight. One of the big things is that of all the issues that we've had as, a, as being members of the indie community, we've never really had a unified voice behind us backing us up when we are hurt by the big guys. And as far as AudibleGate goes right now, we are absolutely getting a unified voice. We've got some of the biggest names out there in the writing community. We've got the science fiction fantasy authors. We've got the Alliance of Independent Authors. We've got Writer Beware. Everyone right now is calling for action against Audible because of their returns policy that uh, is, is literally stealing money out of the pockets of independent authors uh, narrators, audio producers, anybody that's working towards creating audio content, we are feeling the brunt of this really horrible exchange policy. So right now, um, there is a group on Facebook, which is the Fair Deal for Rights Holders and Narrators. I suggest for every author to go ahead and if you don't want to join the group or, or participate in it, at least look through and see what's being said right now. Um, one of the members of this group happened to go through and find a bunch of posts online that show how regular readers are taking advantage of this policy of returning books because they don't really understand that it's it's returning as we know it. They understand it as exchanging, like borrowing from a library. And that's where the biggest problem with Audible's return policy is. It's very poorly worded. Their policy is uh, up to 365 days for a return for any reason. And that's exactly how they promote it to all of their uh, members. They, they use the words exchange. They tell you that you have no reasons, no questions asked, you can return a book for any reason at all. And that prompts people to think that they can use it as an exchange. And it's very easy to do. Um, a lot of the comments that I've seen through this Facebook group and as well as on Twitter say that people have tried it up to nine times without questions asked. Borrowing a book, returning it. Borrowing a book, returning it. No questions asked. After that ninth time, it said that they needed to call support. They called support. And guess what? They got that book returned again. So it's technically a, an unlimited return policy, which really hurts authors and narrators. And again, anybody who's in this production of audiobooks, because it's that, that return creates a debit in that rights holder's account. So if you bought, let's say, a, a six book series, you buy book one, you listen to it you return it. Well, that sale is now refunded back to, or sorry, that sale is now pulled from the author or the rights holder. They no longer get m money for it. You go and take that exchange and get book two. Okay. That registers as a sale. You exchange that for book three, that money's pulled back. So you can go through and exchange every single book in an author series, reading that book essentially for free. The author, the narrator, anybody who was involved in the production of that book gets no money whatsoever. On Which the flip awful. side, for the accountability side for us authors, when we look at our accounts, we don't see itemized sale and return. We just see one number. And sometimes it's negative. And a lot lately, it has been a negative number, which looks completely ridiculous when we see that on a sales sheet with nothing to back it up. So there's no transparency on Audible's side to tell us authors how many of these returns are actually happening and how that's affecting us. And some authors have said that it's almost a 50%. Half uh -huh. their sales are being pulled back, which means they're not getting any money. And if they're in a royalty share, that means both the author and that narrator are both feeling the, the brunt of that. They're both getting their royalties cut from it. While Audible is still pocketing all of your money. So right now we have uh, Writer Beware calling out Audible on this. We have the Alliance of Independent Authors downgrading Audible from a company that's worth working with to a cautionary company. And that's big news because when the Alliance of Independent Authors flags a company as not being reputable, people follow that. 
So them going and cautioning them down to a, a cautionary company to work with is a huge thing. The Authors Guild right now has a uh, petition out there, and I would suggest that anybody who is involved in either reading or producing audiobooks, please go read the letter. The link is in our show notes below. And if you feel the need that, that you want to be a part of this, please sign on for this. We need as many voices as possible right now to, to shout about this, because that will give us an actual chance as the little guy, as the indie, to make a difference. We have never before had enough indie voices to actually make something happen. So please, if you can, sign this petition, share this petition, do whatever you can so that we can get more people on board with this. And, um, and as a reader, as a reader, if you like audiobooks, you really have to understand that if this continues, the author community will stop using ACX at least, you know, and maybe maybe not even do audiobooks because it becomes cost prohibitive. Well, and, and let's talk about that. For for the authors out there who are considering audiobooks <laughs> and for the readers out there who don't know what it takes to make an audiobook, let's tell them what what is it what does it cost time wise and, and monetarily to produce an audiobook? It's about two hundred um per finished hour on average, unless you get a royalty share, which, which you know, the, the um, producer is taking a risk on it. So on average, a book is about eight hours. So that's $1,600 on average. And that's, a, that's actually low um, if you wanna look at it, because a lot of the producers are between 200 and 400 per, per, per finished hour. And then some of the big names go up from there. So that's out of our pockets. Um, you know, and, 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 and if, if you're, if you're exchanging and, you know, let's say somebody like me who doesn't do a huge amount of audio books, if I got this big negative, that means they're taking money out of my bank account to clear it or future royalties to clear it. So that, that means it's not worth the effort or the cost to us. And, then, and let's talk about the royalty share, too. If for some reason, you know, authors do opt to do a royalty <laughs> share, what yeah. that means is they agree to split any profits with the narrator or audio producer of their book for every sale for seven years. You are locked or into a seven-year contract. Yeah, as long yeah, as, for as, long as the, the book, but the minimum yeah. is seven. You can't make right. a change for seven years. Right. So you're splitting 50-50 with that narrator. Audible's royalty to you is about 40% of the sale price of that book. So you're essentially getting 20%. They're getting 20%. And you can't do anything for seven years about that. Right. Yeah, to say the very least, I have, I would love to uh, get my book uh, as an audio book. I have not done that yet because... I am a single mom who's also an author and my only option for getting it done because it is so cost prohibitive would be to do it myself. And even to do it DIY requires you, it, it's not like you sit down in front of your iPhone and you record your voice and then you're done. It's not like you just read your book aloud. You're talking about, you have to have audio equipment to capture good sound or else it's not gonna sound good. Uh, you are going to have to spend hours and hours in front of a microphone training yourself how to read your book correctly because it requires certain enunciation. It requires a certain amount of voice acting in order to do it in a way that it will be listened to later. And then on top of that, uh, you have to do uh, some editing of the, the, the tracks that you record. So it is an enormous, an enormous amount of time goes into creating an audio book and that in itself, if you have a day job, if you have kids or something like that, it's time prohibitive, it's uh, equipment prohibitive. And then if you are going to hire someone else to do it, then it, it is absolutely incredibly cost prohibitive unless you're coming from a position where you already have a lot of money. So, you know, we're talking about something that 
a lot of people love to listen to audiobooks. I know that a lot of people who I know who, you know, aren't able to sit down and read a book either, you know, because of like uh, issues with their their sight, uh, you know, various like medical conditions, uh, reduce their concentration. They would love to be able to have an audiobook. I would love to be able to give that to them. And I have not yet had the opportunity to do it because it is just, it's an enormous amount of work. It's a huge hurdle to get over. And Amazon is basically treating it right now like it's worthless. Uh, if, if you can go get that, listen to it, and then you're talking about something that is an extra expense on top of writing the book. This is something that it's an incredibly valuable thing. It's not worth nothing, but you know, Audible is treating it right now like it is worth nothing. Yeah, and, and to your point well, on the, uh, the I mean, time, I think uh, the average right now, and this is for an, a narrator who knows what they're doing, it's about four hours for every one finished hour of the book. Yes. That's a lot of work. It, to, be fair, to be fair to Amazon, it is nothing. To them, it is a flipping digital file. They don't have to put in any work. They don't have to put in any effort. They don't even have to put in any money to get this content that they get to sell. To them, it is nothing. They have no reason to value it other than actually having respect for human beings who produce this. And they don't. We know first. Well, technically, so though, it's not nothing. Value. It's worth 60% of our royalties per book sold, which none well, of it they have to fun. pay back. Because as you can see, yeah, they're taking but, that money the and they're is, keeping it. Right. But to them, it's literally just storage space. You know, yes, they can they can assign a value on it based on what they can sell it for. But any business person will tell you that that does not necessarily right, reflect the right, actual value exactly. of the product. Yeah, and the fact that they take sixty percent just to store and share your your file yeah that's ridiculous as it is. But on and top it, of that, the that's, insult that's injury if you're exclusive to Audible. If you're yes. not exclusive to Audible, it's even less. That they Joe can. makes a good point here too. They're also relying on us as the advertisers. Yeah. All so, that so that they can continue to pocket their money from us and gain as much readership or excuse me, listenership as possible. <clears throat> well, uh, and you know, I've said this on, on other shows about the whole business of books. But the thing is, Amazon is a corporation. Mm -hmm. Corporations are contractually, legally required to maximize their profits. And, Amazon's and, doing a great and they're, job. And they're a of public that. company, which makes it even worse because they are, yes. the, you know. <laughs> yes. So, so, I mean, the thing is, you know, yeah, Amazon could be a little less douchey about it. Mm -hmm. But the truth of it is, we have created this situation where we've literally required this business to abuse as many people as possible for a few extra pennies. We've created that. And so, I mean, you know, it's great that the indie book community is super involved in this and hopefully this, this actually does do something. But I cannot stress enough how much this is a systemic problem within the economy. And you can see it across all levels of creative enterprise, because as creatives, we tend to be the ones who are the least likely to have something big to back us up. Mm -hmm. So going off that, that legal issue, well, let's talk about the legal issue of what they're doing to rights holders because there's gotta be some legal footing that we can stand on. If they're not selling our book as we agreed to let them do, and they're using it as essentially a, a lending library system, I mean, that, that seems to be the way that it's being used. There should be some kind of legal precedence for us, which again, the big guys out there, I think are putting this together to <laughs> show that they are breaking contract with us by this. Mm-hmm. Because we didn't sign the right away for them to use it as a lending library. We signed our right to sell to them. Right. For a 
commission on that sale. And and their loophole is, well, they return the sale. So I'm yes, but they're money. actively promoting right. these returns as exchanges, right? which wording is very powerful. Yes. And in, in the reader's minds, they are not setting up the expectation that this is an actual return. And the return should be for legitimate reasons, not just, oh, you well, know, I, I finished, finished the book. It, and I, I want another like book. It. I finished yeah, it, I want another book. Exactly. Sorry, but you know, you need to pay for that next book. That's yeah. how sales works. Right. It's not a library. And there are plenty of library services out there that legitimately lend out books. Yes. And there are contracts in place with authors or with draft to digital is one of the great ones where you extend that through them, the ability to send it to the libraries for a certain percentage. And yep. there's a per checkout cost and there is a fee, you know, specifically to the library if they want to take that book and put it as part of their catalog. Right. That is a legitimate way to include it into a lending library. This is a sale straight. That, that's it. It is a sale. It is not a lending library. It is not a Netflix type streaming service. Right. It is you're selling your book for a listener to listen to. Well, I think my, my prediction is that you know, if we manage to get lucky enough that this goes to actual court, which I hope it does. Oh my gosh, all, all, all my thoughts, prayers, energies, vibes, whatever, to that, that end. But I think what it's going to come down to is whether the ruling states that the implications of the business trump the terms of service of the business. Because, you know, as we were talking about before the show, in terms of service can say whatever they want. Most of us haven't had the opportunity to read them word for word and have them reviewed by a lawyer. It'd be nice if we could do that. It'd be nice if I could afford a lawyer long enough to do that. But, you know, that's the thing. I mean, if anybody happens to know a lawyer who wants to do some pro bono work, just have them start posting terms of service breakdowns on YouTube. That would be so flipping awesome. The, uh, the Authors Guild and the Alliance of Independent Authors, I know for sure, as part of your membership, they do have some legal extensions that you can use. So it, it's very beneficial to be a part of these, these types of groups because they do help the little guy in figuring out how to wade through all of the muck. Because we, we don't read legalese. It is English, but it is not the English you or I use on a daily basis. Right. It's and very, it is meant yeah, to be as confusing as possible, which is why no one ever reads the terms and conditions because we don't understand them. And, uh, and it allows for so many loopholes on their end mm -hmm. that they can say they can point to the contract. So, oh, Mark Coker hasn't said anything about that. That's interesting because he's normally very vocal when it comes to anything dealing with the the indie marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that, that is odd. And uh, I've been following on Twitter pretty much all week. I've been following on Facebook pretty much all week, looking at that group that I told you about, um, just to see what's going on. And I know right now they are compiling um, anybody who's emailed Amazon ACX uh, regarding finding out more information, regarding getting actual numbers on these uh, buy versus return, which we don't see. There's no column for it. It just has a number, which lately mine actually showed up as a negative. So I have no clue how many sales I had or lost, but I've got a negative number on one of my books right now. Mm. So I have no clue how it's affecting me. But if you are affected by this, they are collecting this information because they want to compile it all to create this, this um, you know, I don't know if it's going to go to a lawsuit yet, but if they do, they want to have as much information as possible. And again, the show notes will have this below the link to that Facebook group. So I, I do suggest even if you're not signing up for anything, at least go through it, make yourself familiar with what's going on because it does affect us all. And clearly through that group, there has been a lot of people affected right now. It has been blowing up all week. And I've seen negative numbers all along, I guess, you know, on my thing, you know, and I'm like, wait, wait I had more than that yesterday. Oh, I have a negative. Okay, well, somebody returned something. And I never really thought much about it until I saw this. And I did yeah. not know, I had no idea they were um, treating returns as, as exchanges. So that, that really burns me. And, and it's the lack of transparency. Mm -hmm. If you see a column that says sales, 
and you see a column that shows returns, you can estimate, you know, a little bit better exactly how it's affecting your bottom line. Right. If you don't have a two column spread showing you what the sales were versus the returns are, you have nothing to go off of. Right. You don't know if it's affecting you, um, you know, huge financial burden or if it's just, a, you know, every so often there's a book that's that's, you know, sent back, which normal exchanges you can expect, you know, mm -hmm. or returns on exchanges. See, even I'm doing it. Yeah. Normal returns you can expect. That's just how sales go. Some people right. just want to return it for whatever reason. And a reasonable returns policy is not out of the question. Right. 365 day return policy, which is what currently Audible has is ridiculous. Nowhere can can legitimately say that that is a good return policy. And again, no questions asked. If for whatever reason you feel like returning that book, go ahead. No, no, that's not right. And there's no accountability. Again, I don't know how it's affecting my bottom line. I've got a negative number. I've got nothing to go off of. And if you email Am Amazon or ACX, which I did, I haven't gotten a response yet. They're very quiet about it. They don't want to give you those numbers. Well, why? Well, I mean, yeah. that, that's a better guarantee than you can get on a refrigerator. And for, you know, for something that doesn't directly affect the company that gets to make those policies, that's just such bad form. Yeah, it is. Just looking at the comments here. Yeah. Um, Anita has suggested, where is it? Oh, my comments just shifted. Uh, book funnel is is coming up as a an alternative, which is good. I don't think we have a lot of alternatives right now, and we need some alternatives if indies are going to move away from Audible. Um, I, I know a lot of indies right now are using this as a platform to say, "Hey, this is why the book isn't available," and legitimately so. If we don't know that we're actually going to be able to recoup our costs, not even make a profit, right. recoup our costs on yeah. creating this book, there's no reason for us to do it. Yeah, and finding, not just finding alternatives, but finding a competitive alternative is yeah. always, especially the last probably like five or six years, Amazon and Audible have kind of become it. If you are an indie author, especially, if you wanna get your books into the hands of people, you can tell everyone, oh, well, you can find it on Amazon and they know exactly what you're talking about. If you offer them up, some other service through which they can purchase your book. Um, it's really, really difficult. And that is the hard thing with indie books, especially is that there are so many barriers to get people to read your work that the barrier of like, oh, well, where can I find it? Um, that's a, that's another huge one. And you, you have to be able to knock down as many barriers as possible because indie is a hard sell in the first place. People are automatically going to ask the question, well, why couldn't you traditionally publish? Is this, you know, an unedited piece of garbage that like uh, will be completely unreadable? You're already facing an enormous uh, barrier just with that getting an indie book into someone's hands. If you add on top of that an unfamiliar platform, then that's just, you know, another step you have to go through that you really don't need. So yeah, like we we need alternatives and we need alternatives that are welcoming to to the reader uh, as, as well as to us. Absolutely. And and that is the biggest barrier that we run into is is visibility. We have to be where people are buying. And if we're not, getting people to switch to a new service is worse than pulling teeth at that point. Right, right. And, and Melanie here is saying that she doesn't understand why people would even think of returning a book. Um, the, the problem, Melanie, isn't that they're, they're returning them to return them. ACX is promoting an exchange when you finish a book. So it doesn't come across as you're returning the book. You're just using your, your credits to exchange it for a different book to read but that's still considered a return. They still pull that royalty from the creator when you do that. And a lot of the consumers do not know. Right. And if, if Audible is going to, like, 
I can conceive of this as being like not a terrible thing if this were like a streaming service where say every time someone listens to your book, then you get like 20 or 30 cents or something like that. The way it works with, you know, movies streaming on Amazon Prime. Like if that's the deal, then okay, it's not fantastic, but at least it's something. This is not what is happening. This is you are supposedly getting a book sale and then it gets pulled out from under you. Um, so it's it's an entirely different thing. And I am absolutely sure that there are people out there who are using Audible who aren't understanding the difference between those two things. They're so accustomed to a streaming service where they go in, they watch a movie and some of the portion of them watching that movie that gets kicked back to the creators. This is a situation where that's not even remotely what's happening. And I don't know, does Audible, is is that even like, I, I know that Audible has some books for free where it seems like that is what happens, where like 20 or 30 cents or whatever goes to the, the creator because it's like for streaming or something like that. Um, I, I heard something that, about them doing, doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Uh, of you know, if if there were something like that happening, then that's at least moderately reasonable, and you're getting paid for it. Uh, this is this is an entirely different thing, and I'm sure that there are a lot of people out there who are not going to understand the difference. Yeah, and it looks like our our comment section here is talking about the the file creations. Um, Anita had said about book funnel. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, about book funnel being a um, where is it? There it is. Uh, about being an indie alternative. And just to clarify, and Joe makes the comment that Book Funnel is not producing the books. Like ACX allows you to have the platform to, to produce the books. They're not producing the books. They are just providing a platform to distribute them, which is important. You still have to produce the book. And again, that means finding either a narrator or doing it yourself with the right equipment to produce a quality audiobook and then put it on a platform to sell. So that's an important caveat there. And back to the, the production cost, we're looking at about 200 on average per finished hour to create a book. It's not cheap to do the production side of it. Right. So, oh, and sorry, I didn't mean to derail, but I, I saw the comments going that direction. So I just, I wanted to make some clarifications so that, that any of our viewers understand exactly where the differences are. Exactly. And, 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 and maybe the exchange was meant for that service and they just, you know, bubbled it up. Who knows? Cause they did have like the, the lending service type thing um, that they discontinued because they weren't seeing a lot of traction in it and they didn't pay us very well for that either. It was wow. even more, more horrendous of a, a royalty share for that. So, hmm. well, I mean, to be honest, Amazon has been pushing for, you know, authors in particular, since that's the, the platforms that I, I'm familiar with on Amazon, but I'm sure other creatives are seeing it as well. They, they've been pushing for us to allow them to distribute our work for freer and freer and freer. You know, you go into KDP and there is a little checkbox where you can let your, you know, your customers literally pass on the book. Yeah, but the, the lending and, function yeah. goes to, to, I think, one person, so. And, right. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, it's it's a cool little function. But at the same time, you know, when you have, like, most books are, like, a dollar, two dollars, seriously, you need to pass that on for free. <laughs> like, <laughs> you'd sell it for at least that much at a garage sale. Right. We're, we're back to the old uh, meme where it's the cup of coffee versus the book. You spend more on a Starbucks cup of coffee than you do a book, and yet everyone wants to complain about the pricing. Yes. And, you know, the flip side, they don't see it. They don't see what the production cost is to the independent author to produce a book. You know, we talked about the $200 per finished hour for an audiobook, but go back even further. How much yeah. did it cost the, uh, the author to have that book edited? The editing cost alone, the cover art cost alone, mm -hmm. there's a lot of cost just to get that book into print or ebook format, let alone moving on to any other type of platform that costs additional money. 
the, and the years of being able to go from writing a sentence in your third grade English class to writing a functional plot. It's yeah, I definitely, anybody can write a sentence. From definitely from like my experience, for every page that is in one of my novels, there are ten pages behind it that were like cut or rewritten or you know uh, worked over it's like every every sentence there are 10 other sentences that went into the writing of that sentence it's it's an enormous you know it's an enormous amount of effort and and labor just to write the book and then there's a lot of effort on top of that and then if you're going to do an audiobook you're like you're just like tripling, quadrupling up. And that is, unfortunately, I guess this is like part of the great, you know, struggle of being an indie artist just across the board is that it is going to be an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of effort. Um, and most likely the vast majority of the audience is not going to comprehend what it is that you have put into creating this thing. Um, there's just for, for some people that sometimes there's not a lot of value in it in spite of the fact that I don't think that there are any people out there. And I think that some people realize this at the beginning of the pandemic and have kind of forgotten it, but like we as a society kind of rely on music and movies and books to get through the day. They are like a critical part of the vast majority of people's lives. And so, you know, I, I, I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, people kind of got a little bit of education in that and we've sort of like forgotten it rather rapidly, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's tough, especially in, and like, I hate it, but, in in a in a in an economy that you know values that uh, uh, very specific types of products and not others uh you know i think that we're always going to have an undervaluation of arts until we as a culture sort of shift away from our idea of what is valuable and and to put a finer point on it too indie authors when we price our books, we're pricing them to be competitive in the marketplace. We know how much it costs to produce the book. We know how much we as as consumers of books have to spend on books. We understand the cost to the consumer. So we price our books as competitively, competitively as possible. We're not trying to overcharge. A lot of the traditional publishers out there, their ebooks come out at a much higher rate than ours. Oh, well, yes. We're, we're undercutting ourselves to provide value to the customer, to the reader who doesn't value our work. And when it comes to the audiobooks, we don't have control over the pricing. Right. But along with that pricing, we're only getting 40% if we're direct through, through ACX. We're only getting 40%. And if we have a royalty split, we're only getting 20%. And every time a return is made, we've just lost that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, let's be real. The, we we have migrated our entire economy into a Kickstarter culture. So we should just do Kickstarters to pay for our audio books and call it a day. I, have a, I, I don't know. I get, I get a little weird on Kickstarters. I know people do well, them. I know people are very, very great at them, but you, you know, the, my the, job, why would I have somebody pay for it? Well, but, but that's, I don't know. It's, it's just, it's, we, it's we, we have been so used to crowdsourcing everything from, you know, our ability to, you know, put out a, a product that somebody might actually want to buy, not just because it's a good product, but also because now it's pretty and shiny, but, you know, also everything from innovative products because, you know, you can't even get the the grants and loans and, and angel investors and everything to, you know, improve the stuff we have because it's not cheap enough. Mm -hmm. And you can't get, you know, well, I mean, <clears throat> medical care. <clears throat> <laughs> I mean, um, there are other things in life that we have to crowdsource. Like we, we've 
really gone into this crowdsourcing economy, like not only are our customers supposed to buy our stuff, but they're supposed to pre-buy our stuff. Yeah, I, as I said, I have a fundamental problem with that. <laughs> but some people do it and, and, and they do it well, but that is not for me. If I'm going to produce yeah. something, put something but out there. The alternative is this great big corporation that's like, yeah, I can write a sentence too. What you got? Mm -hmm. Right. In, in some cases, the alternative is like, if I know that like I for, like I almost have to recoup my cost on each book that I make if I'm going to do another one. Uh, I just started a series and everyone is like, oh, like when is the next book coming out? And I'm like, I'm going very slowly through editing. And quite frankly, at least part of the reason why my editing is slow is because I know how much I'm going to have to pay to get the book cover done. I know how much I'm going to have to pay to get the interior formatting done. I know how much I'm going to have to pay to get an editor to look over it. And that is scary. I am a single mom with like a day job. I don't know that I'm going to have the funds to do more than one or two books in this series. I really honestly, I don't know where the money will come from in another like five or six years. It is a struggle. It is always going to be a struggle. And if I don't make back the money from a book, then uh, it is going to get increasingly more difficult to produce the next one. Because let's see, my last book, I probably put like $3,000 into it. I've probably seen from that half that. I am $1,500 in the hole on my first book. Uh, if I go another 1500 in the hole on book two, then it is very unlikely that you're going to see a book three. And so, you know, it is an enormous issue. And yes, uh, go Indy now, Joe, you have a great point. Kickstarter is a full-time job in itself. I know, like, I love listening to the music of Pomplamoose on YouTube. They put out a ton of their songs for free and they uh, produce their music by Patreon uh, donations. And the main members of the band for a long time, they weren't making any more music because Patreon in itself is a full-time job. So it is like, it's, it's, it's become enormously unsustainable for all but a select few. And that's absolutely insane that people can no longer be writers. I like, I don't like, I'm sure that like to a certain extent that's always been the case, but certainly these days, if you're going to be an indie author, like you got to really like, you got to hustle and you've got to hustle hard if you're going to, you know, get if it just to sustain and have a day job and be writing on the side. It's a hustle. Well, I mean, really back in the day, people like Jeff Bezos would have like 30 artists that he was supporting completely, like paying their rent, buying their food, the whole nine yards, because that's what you did if you were rich. Yeah, so, the patron of the arts literally paid for the lifestyle of the artist that enhanced their life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, and, and the thing is that the people are like, oh, but, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be wanting more than you've earned. No, look, see, the thing is, Jeff Bezos should be paying me one way or the other. That is how that works. Yeah, that exactly. <laughs> well, I, I think it, it, it plays a lot into what Sarah was saying about just the, the nature of capitalism in, in general is about getting as much bang for your dollar as possible to not caring about the detriment of the little guy that you have to step on to get that profit. And, and that's a very big problem in our system. And it, it's, it's almost the Darwin point for any independent artistry right now. If you don't have the funding in order to make your art too bad. Yep. Well, which, and that's a sad thing in the rest of society as you know artistry becomes less varied less creative less you know filled with people who can actually afford to do it you're going to start seeing more and more you know we we already see it now where there's just like these narrow groups of people who, you know, they only listen to certain kinds of music, they only go to certain kinds of movies, they only do this, they only do that. And then we have these these other 
othering situations in our culture that aren't just based around art and you have these narrow mindedness things that are expanding into other categories and you don't I mean, but that's the thing. Art has always been the soul of a culture. If you suppress art, if you do not encourage it to grow, then you are going to see the soul of your culture die. And that is a long-term effect. And since your bottom line only has to make it to the next quarter, it's never going to be a priority. And, and the bottom line for us indies, it, we're not asking for anything that, that's out of reach. We're asking for fairness. We're right. asking for the ability to be paid for our work fairly, to have returns policies that aren't going to strip us of our income. You know, we're, we're not asking for ridiculous things. We are asking to be treated with respect, with dignity, so that our art can continue to be made. Amen. Yes. Because like it's, it's, it's a meager shelf that we're scraping out for ourselves like baseline. And then it's sort of like, you know, it's Am Amazon has for a long time just sort of trimmed more and more and more out of what was already a very narrow line. <laughs> yeah. And so, and for, yeah. And for some of us, the day jobs that we have right now, like for me, are helping, but I'm, I'm towards the end of my day job career. So at that point, it's going to be very narrowly, you know, narrow budgets, narrow things like that. So my cover whore days are over. <laughs> so, I'm, know, in the same boat. But I'm lucky in that respect. And you with the day job are lucky in some of that respect. There are people that, you know, this is their livelihood. And when, you know, when corporations start stripping away that stuff, that just, I don't know, there's so many things wrong with that. Yeah, I, I feel it too. I mean, my day job has become more about servicing mm -hmm. authors, you know, providing editing, providing cover art, providing uh, formatting layout and instruction on how to publish. And it's cut into my ability to produce books. I typically would produce four books a year. I can't do that right now. And even when I am looking to produce a book, I'm now looking at swapping services with other service providers in order to be able to afford to produce that book because mm -hmm. I'm no longer making back what I have put into those books. And, and I want to put more stuff out. I want to make my readers happy. I want to give them the next book in the series, but I have to be able to do it too. And if I yeah. can't afford to do it, that book has to get pushed back until I can. Yeah, because you have to feed your kids. We all, I mean, seriously, exactly. that's the bottom line and keep the roof over their head. And, you know, this is what people who, decide they want to read for free, take for granted and don't understand what they're doing. So if they love you and want to f have it for free. And, know, and let's, okay, let's, let's talk about that because a lot of times there's that, that question that comes up of, I can't afford a book and I really would like to read this author's work. A lot of authors, if you approach them, will have ways for you to be able to access their book, whether it's library systems Mm -hmm. which is a free thing for the public, whether it's a review exchange. A lot of authors do send out books for the exchange of a review because that positive review or even a negative review, whatever review is out there, can affect the sales of a book. And so a lot of times authors can find ways for you to read their book, legitimate ways that are not going to hurt people. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to put out there that um, instead of going around begging authors for free stuff, Maybe sign up for their newsletters because authors are usually doing giveaways and you don't have to sit there and go, I just want to read it for free and make the author feel like, um, no. like they have to be torn between some sort of generosity that they really can't afford and and not. Yeah. Like, just sign up for my newsletter. Come on, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Okay. And I've, I've never, I've had a lot of people who I knew who were concerned about whether or not they would be able to afford to buy my book. And they were able to go to their local library. They were able to put in a request form that their library carry the book and not a single library. Okay, like one library. And I think it was the one up in Bel Air, Maryland, which is a hoity-toity place. There's only been one place that said no, that they wouldn't carry the book. Um, and I'm an indie author who's like pretty nobody. And 
absolutely, you know, every library was was willing to carry it, uh, except for one. So that is 100% an option. And not only does it mean that the author gets paid, it also means that now their book is on the shelf of the library for other people to read to. It's a great way to go. If you can't afford something, request that your library carry it. And you know, so that I, I've done a few events with uh, library organizations. And so, you know, running an author table for an author organization and talking to librarians, the number one thing I learned is that they have no idea what to order for their books. They're going off of bestseller lists and, and things like that because they, they don't know what their, their people are going to want. Mm -hmm. So you're actually doing a favor by asking right for this specific book because they're like oh my god this is a book that is actually going to get read mm -hmm. of course they're gonna they're gonna get it unless you know they're snort, you know snotty snooty <laughs> you'll be hoity toity hoity toity snooty <laughs> and a lot of libraries really want to be a part of the community that they serve so for an author going in there and either suggesting their book be listed or asking about any any um the, the word just like flew off workshops yeah any workshops um yeah, any type of engagements that they're they're they like, can do you'll do a workshop yeah yeah oh my and god they're yeah do do they're like <laughs> mm -hmm. they they love oh, when an author from the community wants to be a part of the library that serves that same community and mm -hmm. so they generally will welcome you in and help you to to get out there and they will use their newsletters to send to their readers and that further helps you so uh, libraries are yeah. a wonderful wonderful service they they absolutely they absolutely want events that are going to get people in their doors right and the more that they can outsource the actual doing of the event to somebody who wants to do it the happier they are Mm -hmm. And and a lot of libraries are funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, which means they can sometimes pay you to do these workshops. Very often they will. I, I mean, it's not going to be a lot. Um, honestly, okay, the last, the last time I talked to anybody about it, they were talking about like an entire afternoon workshop and they were looking at about $200, maybe $250. And you know, I'm sitting there going, money. And they're like, <laughs> is that gonna be enough? Money. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I to buy some fast food on my way home. <laughs> and that right there is literally how we feel too. That that is yeah. exactly <laughs> but, but but on the outside we're like, well, you know, I, I think I can do it for that much. <laughs> money. <laughs> <laughs> I've had that exact same conversation in my head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, you're going to be you, you, oh, you're going to be looking desperate. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see, uh, Rebecca says all authors should be donating their books to libraries. Of course they should. Uh, mm -hmm. Keep an eye out. Uh, hell, keep an eye out on your books on Amazon. They'll have a sale on your books sometimes when it's low stock and you can get below cost delivered to you. That is true. I actually hate when Amazon discounts books irregularly um, because it throws everything off. But yes, they do sometimes create their own sales. And if yeah. you are keeping an eye on it, you can't let people know. Yeah, unfortunately, I have found old copies. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. ran into that. I have, yeah. I have found that there are some libraries that will not accept books donated yep. by the author. Um, uh, so, yeah, that has actually been an issue with a couple. So you have to make sure that the library will actually accept your book as a donation because some will not. Uh, some, they have to purchase the book in order to carry it uh, because some libraries have stricter like certification processes to ensure that the book is like of a high standard and of a high quality. Like the one library that would not carry my book that was local, it didn't have uh, enough reviews. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, I've run into that too. The, uh, the Las Vegas library system versus the Henderson library system which, you know, Henderson is a suburb. 
Um, Las Vegas is very strict and did not want to accept books unless they had Kirkus reviews and they had like a whole sheet on what they would need you to do in order to get your book in. Whereas the Henderson library system, I walked in and they're like, oh my God, we'll take your books. We even have a local shelf. Look at this. <laughs> so yeah, every <laughs> library is a little bit different, but you know, go to them. You can't find out unless you talk to them. So talk to the librarians near you, go into a suburb, go into a city nearby, talk to the library there and, and see what they'll do for you. The number of times that I've walked into a library, reached into my ginormous purse, picked out one of my books, walked up with this librarian looking at me like, oh God, what does this one want? And gone, do you accept donations? And then they go, why yes. And I go, here, there's a <laughs> card inside. And I walk away. <laughs> that might be a dramatic reenactment, but that's generally how it goes. But if they don't take donations, then they're like, no, we don't. This is what you have to do. And I'm like, yeah, too much work, fine. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I am just entertainment value. <laughs> I know. I love it when the local libraries are, are excited to, to receive a donation. I know, again, Henderson Library does a, an author event every year that is a local author's meet and greet um, where they have so many local authors that they actually have to separate it by shifts in order oh, to wow. get all the authors out there to meet the public. And I look forward to it every year. I think it's wonderful. It's great for me as part of the author community, but it's also a great way to get in touch with the readers of the community. And uh, it, it goes a long way towards helping promote our work. And it promotes mm -hmm. the libraries because we as authors are going, hey, I'm gonna be at an event, come see it. You know, mm -hmm. it, it works for everybody. Oh, and your tip, if you offer to do some sort of poetry writing class, they will literally have an orgasm right there because apparently that's what everybody wants to do is like go to the library in the evenings and write poetry. <laughs> any any classes really? I've I've done many many classes yeah, on poetry, writing, like on soul. publishing, anything, just any educational. Oh my god, they love that. They absolutely love that. And if you write children's books. I mean, you could just literally watch their heads explode. They're just like, <laughs> wait, wait, make that face again. Let's see it. <laughs> <laughs> I see we got a comment from Joe here. Uh, libraries send out feelers and pull. Yeah, the, the libraries are very involved in the community, and that's what helps. All right, go ahead, more Megan. I like. I wonder if it like part of the reason why Amazon is even able to get away with some of this stuff is because a lot of people don't even know what their local library resources are. A lot of libraries have purchased these audiobooks and make them available to people with a library card through an app. Or like a lot of libraries have digital copies of books that you can read on the app. And this is a copy of the book that has been paid for, that the author is receiving money for, and you don't have to pay anything to like receive this amazing gift. Like libraries are an enormous resource. You don't like all the have to be in the area. You don't need Amazon to get audiobooks for free. Your library also has them. It's like oh. totally there at your fingertips. Not not just your library. You can go to other libraries. And get a library card. I mean, the, the at this point, they're just like, we just count the checkouts. We don't care where you're from. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's it's amazing. And, you know, I, I, I think that it would be a lovely um, social experiment in the hypothetical sense to see what might happen to the uh, community embrace of local libraries if someone were to say destroy Amazon servers and shut them down for a few weeks hypothetically yes no I, I mean we're still getting paid by I mean, them so we don't want their servers to crash <laughs> it needs to happen <laughs> we, we, we need to be able to reset back into more local and more physical type of things because I mean, yes, it's convenient. You can go anywhere in the world and get Amazon. Great. They can also 
do nasty, nasty, nasty things to you and anybody else they want to because of that. It's like Genghis Khan, except Genghis Khan was kind of cool. Well, that's <laughs> why luckily right now, and, and I'm crossing my fingers, but luckily we have some big voices talking about this problem who are willing to go to bat in order to help stop Audible from having this, this policy in place that's hurting us as, as authors, as narrators, audio engineers, anybody who's involved in the creation of an audiobook. Um, we've got the, um, the Alliance of Independent Authors, which is a membership guild. If you want to join them as an indie author, check them out. There are services that they provide. Again, legal services is one of them, which is very important. Same thing with the Authors Guild. Um, most of the like the science fiction, science fiction and fantasy authors, the horror guild authors, all the genre type guilds have services in place to help authors. So I would suggest looking into joining one of these author memberships um, to, to be able to get some protections and some help as an indie. Um, but right now, the Authors Guild has specifically made the call to action. The link is in the notes below on how you can find that petition, how you can find more information about what's going on with AudibleGate. And if you feel that you want to sign your name to it, please do. If you can't sign your name to it, at least share it so that we can get the message out because it is very important that right now we unify as indies and try and change these policies that are hurting us. Yeah, I think that the only way to really like make a difference in these things is to work together and like not just educate each other, but also educate the audience that is consuming these things, like sort of help them to understand what is the time and effort that is going into this? What is the cost to us? How are we getting this to you? And then how can you guys, you readers help make sure that we're able to get you the next book that you so desperately want? Because people always want the next book. We need help getting there sometimes. We do, we absolutely do. All right. Well, before we go, we've got to, to uh, pay homage to our other sponsor, who's always very active in the comments, Miss Rebecca Jonesy. She has a brand new book out right now, which you definitely need to check out, but check out her entire series, obviously. She is Mistress Rebecca Dirty Jonesy, and we promise you will be entertained. So thank you, Rebecca, for being a sponsor for our show tonight. And uh, we are actually gone over our hour. I can't believe how fast that went. But before we go, we always invite our guests to let us know if you have anything special you wanna talk about. So Megan, since you're the new one, you've got anything upcoming or some news, let us know. Let's see, I am currently finishing up the editing on uh, The Altered Rise. It is absolutely happening. Uh, it's it's written, the editing is happening. Uh, I've been talking to my book cover artist, so we're getting that squared away. And in the meantime, I also have a podcast called uh, Cocktails and Cookbooks, uh, which has been a lot of fun. It's been sort of my pandemic outlet. So yeah, go check out my, my other thing that I'm doing, Cocktails and Cookbooks in the meantime. <laughs> we'll have to get that link from you so I can post that in the show notes. All right, and Sarah, what's going on with you? Oh my gosh. Okay, so I'm doing a thing that is a compilation between uh, Twitch streamers and a site called World Anvil that provides world building tools. Highly recommend them. They do have a free version, just so you know. Um, where it's called Game of Tones, and we are all competing for our nano projects to be the last house standing against the horde of the undead. And it's been a great amount of fun. In doing that, I have been nano rebelling. So I am actually working on finishing all of the whips that I've let dangle way too long. I have finished two books so far, so look for them. They will be coming soon. And I'm working on a third. Busy, busy. Yeah, I might be <laughs> busy now. I would ask if you sleep, but I already know the answer to that. What about you, Katie? With, with, with I was going to say, Jane, Jane, didn't you just? I'll do that last. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, fine. 
All right. Well, for me, you guys know that I am reading every Sunday from A Weapon of Magical Destruction. Last week was chapter 20. This week, we're moving into chapter 21. And I'm going to begin to ask everybody with each new chapter read, who do you think the villain is? Joe's been following along and he has an idea of who the villain is and he's been giving me his theory each week. So I'd like to hear from the rest of you guys who are following along. Who do you think the villain is? And on top of that, for the authors out there who are struggling to finish their book, guess what? I've got the solution for those stressed out authors coming in December, actually on Christmas Day. There is a uh, write and edit the damn book. So <laughs> looking forward to that. All right, Jane, your turn. I, I'm like Sarah. I've been like a writing fiend. So in December, I have two books coming out. I have <laughs> Finding Death, which is the follow-up to Grimm's Daughter. And then after Finding Death, there's Reap the Dead, which is a short story between Finding Death and Kissing Fate. So both of those will be out in December. Writing <laughs> the Dead, as always. Yep. <laughs> and I'm All 7,500 right. words into Kissing Fate. <laughs> I, I will never catch up to you. You, you are <laughs> that one I'm on a roll. You Sorry. are the master. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you for hanging out with us this week. Thank you for following along and definitely for giving your opinions on the Audible Gate issue. We will definitely touch on it later and let you guys know what's happening, um, if there's any big news in it in future episodes. And um, until then, we will uh, see you next week. Bye, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye.